tonight, the deal on steel. There was no one breakthrough moment. It was just a lot of steady conversations. Justin Trudeau's political win a year in the making. We'll look at the economic cost. Oh, no. New abortion laws in the U.S. spark political fundraising in Canada. But are the Liberals just fear-mongering? They will come in and have dismay or despair. And a new U.K. mental health concern, Brexit anxiety. How they're coping on another bad news day. This is The National. It is a huge win for the Liberal government, the Canadian steel industry, and even Canada-U.S. relations. Last June, the Trump administration hit Canada with stiff trade tariffs, 25% on steel, 10% on aluminum. Canada then retaliated with punishing tariffs on U.S. products. Well, since then, a grinding trade stalemate, but today the walls came down. Both sides have agreed to end the battle. And as Katie Simpson explains, they are already celebrating in Canada's steel town. I wanted you all to hear it. First, we just got a full lift on the steel and aluminum tariffs. Right on. Canadian steel workers have been waiting nearly a year for this news. The Prime Minister just as relieved as they are that the tariff war with Canada's closest ally is coming to an end. I think the, the, there was no one breakthrough moment. It was just a lot of steady conversations. Conversations that started a few weeks ago and continued right into this morning when a deal between Canada, the U.S. and Mexico was struck to lift tariffs within 48 hours. It came together after the Americans backed down on a request to introduce a quota system that would cap how much steel and aluminum Mexico and Canada could sell in the U.S. Instead, all three countries promised to take additional steps to stop cheap Chinese steel from flooding the market by adopting a new monitoring system. Now that we've had a full lift on these tariffs, uh, we are going to work with the United States on timing for ratification. So that deal is going to be a fantastic deal for our country, and hopefully Congress will approve the USMCA quickly. They're talking about the new NAFTA, and sources say it's Donald Trump's desire to get that deal passed through Congress that was the catalyst for today's agreement. Trump is said to be desperate for a public win, since his trade talks with China are not going well. Canada and Mexico had both warned ratification would not happen unless the tariffs were lifted. After an intense two weeks of phone calls and meetings, all sides found common ground. It's unfortunate it took this long, but I think the workers in the industry can feel relief. Uh, they can get back to normalcy. All right, so Katie, give us a little bit more on the last-minute push. How did they actually get there? Prime Minister Trudeau had back-to-back -back calls with President Trump last week, and sources say Trudeau really leaned into any insecurity that Trump was feeling around his very difficult trade talks with China. Trudeau used the opportunity to remind Trump that Canada is an ally, Canada is not a national security threat, and when you take a look at what's going on between Beijing and Washington, it's a really big contrast. Ultimately, though, this is really about ratifying NAFTA. That is Donald Trump's goal, and some key members of Congress made it clear that could be a the tariffs could be a deal breaker and if the tariffs don't go they won't approve it so ultimately at the end of the day that helped get it across the finish line okay katie always great to see you thanks very much thanks remember donald trump is a big believer in weaponized tariffs but as the dust settles tonight a question did they actually work peter armstrong looks at three pieces of the puzzle It's been a painful year for anyone who buys, uses, or makes anything with steel, which is just about everyone. Are you going to back down on the tariffs? No, we're not backing down. Donald Trump remains convinced tariffs work, but the last year of steel prices tells a different story. Tit-for-tat tariffs meant the price of steel used for everything, from nails to construction equipment to cars, went up by 25%. We're all worse off. Uh, there have been costs imposed on the United States. There have been costs imposed on U.S. trading partners, including Canada. And to what end? One U.S. think tank says any jobs that were added to the American steel industry cost the U.S. taxpayer almost a million dollars each. 
It didn't even help the biggest U.S. steel companies. While tariffs kept their prices artificially high, they actually lost value. Remember, a tariff is just a fancy word for a tax. A tax American companies were forced to pay when they bought Canadian steel. But since that was their best option, Canadian steel giant Stelco had a banner year. We actually had the highest profit margin of any North American public steel company. So the tariffs disappear, which should mean the U.S. can focus on negotiating trade peace with China. And that's good news for this country, as it's increasingly clear none of Canada's issues with Beijing get addressed until that broader conflict gets resolved. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Today, Missouri became the latest U.S. state to pass a so-called heartbeat bill banning abortions after eight weeks of pregnancy, the only exemption, a medical emergency, not rape, not incest. It's the second state this week to pass such a ban, a victory for some, terrifying for others. Freedom cannot be bought with the blood of our children. This gives more rights to the rapist than it does to the mother. The debate in Missouri today, emotional. Women brought all of us into this world, and I sure hope they vote all of us out. Vote, no, the vote vote, no, now. punctuated by cries from the gallery. But in the end, in this Republican legislature, it wasn't even close. The bill passed 110 to 44. It now goes to the governor. And after comments like this, this pro-life administration will not back down. There is no question he intends to sign it. Now, as all of that played out this week in the U.S., it sparked some conversations in this country. Some Canadians worried about what could happen here. And with the federal election coming up, some Canadian politicians picked up on that anxiety. Here's Hannah Thibodeau. You just said to my daughter, you don't matter. It's a discussion all over social media. My buddy, my choice reaction to the abortion debate in the U.S. was heard by Canadian politicians. We are deeply disappointed by uh, the backsliding on women's rights. And the Prime Minister quickly played on those fears. It's a shame that we increasingly see conservative uh, governments and conservative politicians uh, taking away rights that have been hard fought over many, many years. The Liberals even sent out this fundraising email citing 12 Conservative MPs who attended last week's March for Life. If laws are going to change in this country, it will not come just from a small group of courageous MPs. It will come because of a groundswell across this country of people like yourselves. But how real is the threat? I've made it very, very clear. Canadians can have absolute confidence that a Conservative government after the election in October will not reopen this issue. Sounds like the usual liberal fear mongering that happens every single time there's an election coming up where Conservatives have a chance. And remember, the Harper government was in power for nearly a decade, and abortion was never recriminalized, despite pressure from some social Conservatives. Our government's going to do uh, everything we can to uh, keep from reopening that particular debate. And we'll be fighting back. Still, these young women say what's happening now south of the border upsets them. It kind of motivates me to do more and to say that we need more education on these issues. We are talking to each other constantly. We are watching out. We are aware of our rights and we will be fighting for our rights. The Liberals will continue to try to make this into an issue, to distinguish themselves from the Conservatives, even if the issue itself is not on the table. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. For days now, between the U.S. and Iran, there has been escalating rhetoric and alarm. Talk of deploying troops, bombers and warships to the region. Intelligence that Iran was moving missiles around, threatening U.S. positions in Iraq. But as Keith Bogue tells us, the whispers now in Washington are that at least part of this may just be two countries misreading each other. As he often does, Donald Trump blamed the media, this time for confusing Iran about U.S. intentions. You know, we're right now dealing with Iran, and they put out so many false messages that Iran is totally confused. I don't know, that might be a good thing. No, they put out the, the fake news. They put out messages. These people right back here. They he seemed to be talking about a Wall Street Journal report that said Iran was confused by recent U.S. actions. Actions such as drawing attention to a U.S. naval buildup in the Persian Gulf, even though it was a routine and long-planned deployment. 
The reports of those movements were accurate, though they might indeed have confused the Iranians. They certainly seem to have confused U.S. lawmakers. There are a lot of senators feel like they're in the dark and they dropped the ball on this. The unanswered question again is, are they reacting to our assertions of uh, uh, action in the Middle East or are we reacting to them? Earlier this week, Trump tried to clear up reports that his national security advisor had asked for an updated plan to send 120,000 troops to the Middle East. Uh, I think it's fake news, okay? Now, would I do that? Absolutely. But we have not planned for that. Hopefully, we're not going to have to plan for that. And if we did that, we'd send a hell of a lot more troops than that. How Iran was supposed to react to that, Adrian, who can say? But what does seem clear is that the intelligence community felt it had to get out a message that it now understood, first, that Iran was confused by U.S. actions, and second, that Iran's military moves were in reaction to U.S. moves. And so the vehicle for clearing things up seems to have been the Wall Street Journal today rather than the White House. So are we to take from this then that, that tensions are sort of ramping down a bit? Well, that's probably what it means for now. Trump campaigned on not getting involved in foreign wars, so he's risk averse on being too confrontational with Iran. The question is whether the hawkish people he's chosen to advise him are as risk averse as he is. But ultimately, there's also a question about whether the president has a real strategy for dealing with Iran since he pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal last year. The answer to that appears to be no. Okay, Keith Bogan, Washington. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Adrian. Now, all the talk of military deployments and an imminent threat had some ominously comparing this to the run-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. So here's why they might have thought that way. Mr. President, are we going to war with Iran? Oh, not. not very reassuring, that. And war watchers definitely have their eyes on Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton. He was the one trumpeting the latest carrier deployment to the Gulf and pushing a maximum pressure campaign on Tehran. He's an Iran hawk now. You know, uh, Iran is a rogue regime. And he was an Iran hawk back in 2003 when he was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Beyond al-Qaeda, the most serious concern is Iraq. He's common to both stories, but he was surrounded in 2003 by others who thought like that, frankly. Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld, that's simply not true in the Trump administration. Trump made it clear he's not keen on a war. He has asked Iran's leader to call him. The military buildup in the works, if it happens at all, does not match the one in 2003. But that doesn't mean there aren't risks now. If there's a danger of any miscalculation here right now, it's that the hardliners in Iran decide to push and to take advantage of what they think is the weakness of a U.S. president. Which means the danger today may not be some long-planned invasion, but the lack of a coherent plan. Some other stories we're following tonight, including B.C.'s Supreme Court finding a former polygamous leader guilty in a child bride case. James Oler was accused of removing an underage girl from Canada and arranging for her to be married in the U.S. The judge found he was likely aware the 15-year-old would be subject to sexual activity with a much older man. Today's ruling ends a lengthy court process. Oler was originally acquitted back in 2017. He will be sentenced in July. And Australians are at the polls, and it is predicted they will have a new prime minister tomorrow. Promising action on climate change, Bill Shorten and the centre-left Labour Party are favoured to win. Scott Morrison is the current Prime Minister, but he only got the job in August. You would be forgiven for not recognising him. The country has had five leaders in the last ten years. The Conservative Party didn't want to be fighting these. We wanted to be out of the European Union. Indeed, if Parliament had backed our Brexit deal, we could already have left the EU. After six weeks of bickering, talks between Britain's Conservative government and the opposition have failed. They were trying to find something, anything, to agree to, agree to on Brexit. That's a task that seemed doomed from the start. Now Theresa May has agreed to step down as Prime Minister, likely before summer's end. There is little hope any successor, such as maybe Boris Johnson, will fare any better.
Next Thursday, Brits vote in elections to the European Parliament three years after they opted to quit. They are mad and primed to take their frustrations out of the polls. All of that is taking a toll on Britain's collective psyche. Experts are seeing more sleeplessness, more anxiety, even more depression. As Thomas Dagla tells us, to some, the country is getting close to a national breakdown. But sometimes emotions need to be opened a little. How's this for a break from reality? At Birmingham City University, they're meditating to relieve stress from that B word. I'd like you to see if you can be aware of how you feel when I say the word Brexit. This is what Britain has come to after three years of uncertainty since the referendum. Now I'd like you to bring to mind somebody who voted differently from you did. Maybe you feel a sense of tension or anxiety. Psychology lecturer Rebecca Simmons-Wheeler thought up the Brexit-focused sessions. We can really get stuck in our heads in these thought processes, and those thought processes, you know, rumination is linked with anxiety, with depressions. Yes, the idea is to promote better mental health at a time when the country feels on edge. Having a little stretch, if you like. I think a lot of people are fed up with Brexit. It's been so long. And it's the same thing that's kind of daily on the news. It's just been too much, hasn't it? It's just been too many people shouting. Consider the Brexit supporters fed up with delays to the plan they were promised. Or the EU Remainers nervous about the country's future. No one would know that three years later, this is the state that we'd be in. Psychotherapist Susie Orbach now hears clients bring up Brexit all the time they will come in and have dismay or despair. She compares it to the effects but of a divorce, a especially bruising when one partner but never wanted to break happen. up. But what's the word Is for this? Depression? I don't know that the country's in depression. I think there, there are depressive aspects. I think it's more confused and destabilized. You might also have questions about how leaving the EU will affect you. Destabilizing indeed with constant reminders like ads on TV, even on bus shelters warning EU citizens to register if they want to stay after Brexit. All the more exasperating for European nationals like Annette Polner. This is my home. I lived here for such a long time. And uh, I know that if we crash out, I will lose all my rights. I don't feel safe here anymore. If you voted to leave the EU, in Birmingham, they're dealing with the crisis as best they can, considering. Brexit is a condition, if you like, which is entirely self-inflicted. So now we find this, this untangling is becoming really painful. And soon it's back to reality again. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Birmingham, England. Ahead on the national history in Taiwan, and celebrations around the world the moment same-sex marriage became legal. First, though, they signed up, they lost weight, but say they were ripped off. Go Public investigates. If you have over 20 pounds to lose, you could qualify for a weight loss grant up to $2,000. Do you feel that, that you were taken advantage of? I'll say it over and over again. I held up my end of the bargain, and I don't feel like they are. Some clients of a weight loss program are going public with their story tonight. They say they lost more than weight. They're out of money as well. After joining something called the Weight Loss Grants Program, Rosa Marcatelli has our Go Public investigation. If you have over 20 pounds to lose, the ads are everywhere. Get paid to lose weight. There's no cost to apply and no risk. Rochelle Prevo says she followed all the rules. She also signed up for the diet program specifically recommended by the grants company called Dalewood Health Clinic. She and others paid $2,400 up front after being told they'd get up to 80% back in grants. She lost 50 pounds, 23 kilograms, before the deadline, but her grant was rejected. The grants company says she broke a rule by recording her final weight too early. That rule didn't exist when Prevo took part in the program. It felt like they were 
um, moving the goalposts. The program also required participants to write a review for the website before the grants company would even consider giving them the money. Larry Smith says he worried he wouldn't get paid if he didn't. His $1,900 grant was approved last August, but there's still no check. You've got to write a happy letter and then hope you get paid. What customers say they didn't know is the weight loss grants program and that diet program it recommended are connected. They used to share the same office and our investigation found they also have the same person running both companies right now. Dalewood says that person is an impartial temporary consultant. I think it is a conflict of interest. Consumers should be uh, made aware that there's a relationship if in fact there is one. Dalewood says there's no conflict of interest that customers can go wherever they like to lose their weight. The diet clinic is now changing its name to Trillium Weight Loss. We asked the weight loss grant program why so many people say the grants are hard to get. The response came from Dalewood, saying it recently started cracking down because fraudulent claims had gotten out of control. It says more than $730,000 worth of grants have been paid out since 2015. That amount can't be verified, but GoPublic did speak with other customers who say they did get their grants. Those that didn't aren't buying the fraud claim. Do you feel that, that you were taken advantage of? I'll say it over and over again. I held up my end of the bargain, and I don't feel like they are. After GoPublic's investigation, the grants program has shut down. It says it's because there were too many fraudulent claims. The company reacted to GoPublic's story on its website. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Next on The National. Look at her. She may be gone now, but that grumpy face will live on forever. At least on the internet, we'll look at the memes and the tributes. First, though, the pop music and politics at this year's Eurovision Song Contest. This is the one stage when you stand together, no matter gender, no matter ethnicity, no matter color. Even for an event that has seen a piano set on fire, a performing turkey puppet, and a metal-clad drag queen, this year's Eurovision Song Contest finale is going to be different. Just days ago, the host country was taking rocket fire and launching airstrikes. Now, against the backdrop of conflict, Madonna is set to perform. And as Derek Stoffel explains, it's thanks in part to a Canadian. You need my the Eurovision Song Contest is back. 42 countries competing, but this year... <laughs> amid the kitsch and the camp, there's controversy. Because of where Eurovision is being held, along the Israeli shores of the Mediterranean Sea in Tel Aviv. Remember, it was just over a week ago, one hour south, when rockets and mortars, more than 600, were fired by Palestinian militants toward Israel. It responded with punishing airstrikes. 23 Palestinians and four in Israel were killed. There's now a ceasefire in effect, but Israeli police have stepped up patrols all around Tel Aviv. Shalom! Pro-Palestinian protesters are trying to shine the spotlight away from the glitz of Eurovision, instead focusing on Israel's treatment of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank and blockaded Gaza Strip. It's a moral obligation to, if Europe is coming here, to tell them, you know where you are, right? You know what's happening here, right? You have to know, you have a moral obligation to know. A teacher, a nun, a singer. The protesters have also set their sights on Madonna. I'm a spy calling on the Queen of Pop to cancel a guest performance scheduled during the Eurovision finale. X. X. I'm Madam X. Sylvan Adams is an Israeli-Canadian billionaire and philanthropist who spent somewhere around a million dollars to bring Madonna to Tel Aviv. He's not worried about calls by activists to boycott this year's Eurovision. They're basically ignorant and uh, they, I would invite them to come here and, and, and experience uh, Eurovision and Israel for themselves and maybe they'd uh, have their eyes open. 
Ouch. The Israeli singer Netta won last year's Eurovision with this dance hit, Toy. She says the song contest is all about bringing people together, not politics. This is the one stage when you stand together, no matter gender, no matter ethnicity, no matter color, sexual preferences, and you stand equal and clean with a message of love. That's a message, though, that's often hard to hear in a part of the world where even music and culture bring controversy. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Toronto. Canadian conductor Yannick Nézé-Séguin has just wrapped his first season as musical director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. He led three productions to rave reviews, so tonight we want to revisit a chat Rosie had with him last winter about his meteoric rise and his hopes for the Met. <laughs> The Metropolitan Opera in New York is one of the world's grand stages. Regal, legendary, prestigious. But in recent years, the Met has faced its share of struggles, most notably a scandal involving its since-fired music director. The group fired James Levine after a sexual misconduct investigation. The Met required a new direction. Enter Yannick nézé Sege, a Montreal-born star of the classical music world. The 43-year-old Canadian maestro is considered a music visionary. He was primed to take the role in 2020, but with the need for fresh leadership, <laughs> he was thrust into the job of a lifetime two years earlier than expected. Becoming just the third music director in the Met's illustrious history. He's known for his energy, exuberance, and connection to his orchestra. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Welcome us to your new home. Yes. I met up with him in New York. Nice to meet you, finally. Yes. <laughs> I've read and heard a lot about you. You're sort of a, I don't you're a phenomenon. Oi. I don't know. I, I, I have a pretty interesting life. You do. And uh, it's true that I'm one of those people who can really say that I'm living my dream. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I'm lucky. Watching you is quite fascinating. I mean, I've watched some videos, but it's different to see you in person. The way you are, it's not just a guy waving a, a stick. <laughs> it's, you, you are sort of... Your body is taken over by it. Lots of emotion. What, yeah. What's happening inside yeah. here when you're doing that? So the philosophy for me is that I should, as a conductor, um, express the music with every way possible. The stick and the hands is, of course, the most common way or maybe the clearest way. Mm -hmm. But the emotion has have to come from the face, from the mouth, the whole body. I'm, uh, some people would say, diminutive st stature. <laughs> so I have to also uh, take more space. Yes. I never restrain myself to a place where I, I say, oh, you need to hold back. I'm less animated than I was 10 years ago, but that's just experience mm -hmm. and trust and, co and self-confidence and maturity. Mm. Maybe some people think that we take our stick and we look uh, in the mirror and we try uh, if it looks good or clear and it never should happen. It should be just the mind. Well, that's what you look like when you were 10 on that video that everyone has seen. It does look like you were pretending to be a yeah. what you thought a conductor was. <laughs> Don't you think I didn't change? I, when I look at this, I say, hey, I'm doing the same the thing. The facial now. expressions are very similar. You said once that, it, that this job was almost too big for one person. Yeah, I Do mean. Do you still think that now that you're sort of in the midst of it? No. <laughs> Well, it's too late now, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> I want to make it work. No, it's, it's just, it is the, the Met is the largest performing arts organization in the world. Yes. So this is like, just thinking about this is a bit, <gasps> so at the end of the day, the conductor is the only constant presence which has to 
make it happen together mm -hmm. in the moment. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I see it and I conceive my job. And this is why maybe it's, I felt at some point this was maybe a, too much, but now I realize that this is also plays into my strengths, let's yes. put it this way, because I, the, the thing I like the most about my profession of conductor is to bring people together mm -hmm. and make them give their best. So, so there was a, an interesting moment today when I was here for the rehearsal uh, where you, you had 10 minutes left and you stopped and you said to the, the pit, listen, I have this crazy idea, I want to bring you all up on stage. And I watched you, but I also watched them and they all sort of went, what? <laughs> Is this guy crazy? <laughs> That's unusual, clearly, because of their reaction. What does that tell us about the kind of hmm. person you are, that you want to do that? I think there's such a collective effort in this that it's my role to feature that aspect of the teamwork even more, especially from the orchestra. And this orchestra, I consider it the best opera orchestra in the world and I want them to feel that they are really part yeah. and I had people crying after this coming to me saying I'm s we're so moved that you think Aww. of doing this for us and this is a um, learning process I think of my leadership yes. but also their the way that they feel that they can take their own place within a huge organization like the Met is. Well, you also have said that there had been a culture of you don't say anything to the maestro. You don't question him. Mm -hmm. He's in charge, which it seems a very dated uh, yes. way of doing business, but yes. obviously was still around. <laughs> so when you told yeah. people, yes, you can call me maestro, that's okay, but this is a collaboration. Yeah. Has there been pushback in any of the places where, where so you've been? There would never was any pushback. I have to respect, though, that you can't have the people change a culture overnight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being collaborative doesn't mean uh, not being clear in what we request. Um, if you had been to rehearsal yesterday, you would have seen maybe a sharper version of me where I needed to be much more assertive about, hey, I heard this about is it from some of the floor hands, actually. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And they no, said it was the first time they had heard you be a little sharp, yeah. but they actually respected it. Yeah, you know, one has to still be in charge, yeah. but in charge respectfully. Do you feel a pressure in this position that is sort of apart from just the title? There are financial uh, issues uh, at the Metropolitan. I wouldn't say, you know, young people are rushing for opera tickets. Um, there is the issue around the, the previous conductor and sort of how do you redefine things after that, regardless of how it ends. There's a bit of a redemption story for the opera house there too. Do you feel that pressure? I'm certainly not oblivious to that pressure. <laughs> but here with the Met, it's a question of, yes, um, uh, healing process somehow with certain traumatic yes. experiences yes. but it's also a question of relevance I think is there is more the connection yes the connection of the house with every inhabitant of New York it's also the way we welcome young people or regardless of age just people from certain communities or people who feel that it's not for them. Yeah, it's the not way, accessible. Right, right, and it's it's not true in a way. It's People can go to the opera without knowing a, a, a word from the story. The Met is working hard to open doors to new audiences, from commissioning operas written by women to bringing opera into the classroom. The question now, can opera become cool for a new generation? I think <laughs> opera is cool. I think it can become cooler. It can be <laughs> hip. And the way to do it yes. is interesting. I think making it known, making it accessible, in ser and when I say accessible, is more people feeling welcome. Yes. But never, never, ever dumbing it down. You know, just that is how it's going to stay and become more hip. What should Canadians that are watching, who you might, might get to New York, might get a chance to see you here, maybe not. What should they 
make of you sort of taking the world over? I wouldn't be here if it were not because of who I am as a Canadian and the deep values we have. I think this way of approaching people with a lot of um, open mind to everyone else's opinion and input, but mm -hmm. also the need for creativity, the need and the encouragement when you grew up in Montreal, as I did. And if you're different at 22 and you want to do Beethoven a different way and Verdi a different way, it is not discouraged, it's encouraged. You ever get tired? As everyone. <laughs> no, I don't think you do. <laughs> I do have an energy level yeah. above the average. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It's you got a little this. Energizer Bunny thing going on. Yeah. <laughs> Energizer Bunny, that's me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. They both have that amped up energy. Up next on The National, we'll look at the push to get more young people into Canada's museums. It's packed. I walk down the line. I say, hey, why are you here? And they look at me like I'm idiots because they're like, it's free. That story is straight after the break. But first. <laughs> so, uh... In case you missed it, if the internet really was created for cats, well, then some sad news. Grumpy Cat is dead. After seven years as a furry metaphor for the futility of existence. First appearing in 2012, Grumpy Cat, whose real name was Tartar Sauce, which might explain the attitude, grew from popular meme to bona fide animal celebrity. By 2014, she was so big, she scored a TV movie deal. Fail, then you are a loser. Grumpy Cat had millions of social media followers eager to know what she hated each and every day. Carpets, ugh, the worst. Roombas get Grumpy Cat off that stupid thing. People lining up for hours just for a chance to pet her. What a bunch of fools. Christmas wasn't safe either. I mean, who hates Christmas? Grumpy Cat obviously did. Grumpy Cat even hated the last season of Game of Thrones, though to be fair, she was not alone on that one. And now her legions of fans are in mourning, many posting photos of their own cats doing their best Grumpy Cat impressions. A fitting tribute, all things considered. So wherever you are in the afterlife, Grumpy Cat, know you are missed and try to enjoy yourself, even though we already know there's no way you will. That's an airplane. That's a military airplane in our building. So we have an update on this F-16 fighter jet, which crashed through the roof of an industrial building yesterday. Officials say it was carrying live ammunition. The military jet had a hydraulic failure while trying to land on a nearby air base. The pilot ejected just before the crash, but 13 people on the ground were injured. They are all stable in hospital. The ball liberals are on their way out. The tide is receding and I am not conceding. Well, as it stands, Chess Crosby is the leader of the opposition in Newfoundland, Labrador, but as you just heard, he has not accepted that yet. His party won 15 of the 40 seats in last night's election, while the Liberals finished with 20. Crosby says he will call on the three NDP members and two independents to form a coalition. And we now have our first look at the newest royal baby's birth certificate. One question that has been answered. Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor was born at a private hospital, not at home, as had been speculated. And as to occupation, Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, is listed as Princess of the United Kingdom. Now, Saturday marks International Museum Day this year, celebrating museums as cultural hubs. But... Whatever the hook, getting people through the doors is a big challenge. So the Art Gallery of Ontario is trying something a bit radical. Admission is free if you're 25 and younger. A little older, annual passes start at just 35 bucks. But how can low prices today lead to prosperity in the future? Eli Glasner went to find out. And this is where all hours would... Well, actually... all hours is all museum. Right? With all this so, beautiful, beautiful stuff absolutely. on the wall. Art Gallery of Ontario CEO Stefan Yost remembers the moment when he decided they needed to change. 
It was a Wednesday night when anyone can enter for free. It's packed. I walk down the line. I say, hey, why are you here? And they look at me like I'm idiots because they're like, it's free. OK, so right there you know that our price point is prohibitive for a certain segment of the community. What are you hoping to see? What Yo do says although 20 to 30 year olds are the biggest part of the AGO's demographic, admission prices were keeping more young people and new immigrants away. OK, that's our future. So it's actually not a great risk to bet on your future. Actually, the bigger risk is not betting on them. Yo says if the new approach fails, it could cost the AGO $4 million in lost revenue. So this is a pilot project designed to run for a year and supported by $1.8 million from donors. The goal, a new generation of gallery goers. We're pretty sure if you come in your early 20s, you'll come in your early 50s, and you'll come in your early 80s. This is really a great photo. Gail Lord works with museums around the world. I think it's terrific that they're doing it. I don't think it's a big risk. However, we have a tendency in Canada, when we try things, we do it for a year. You don't change human behavior in one year. It is so relevant. Lord says lowering admission prices makes sense because it's only 10% of revenue. She points to Washington and London, where the entrance to national museums is free. In the UK, it resulted in 30 to 50% increase in attendance, and they have broken uh, the social class barrier with free. But admission is only part of the puzzle. This is one of the ways the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts is attracting new audiences, by attracting Kim Kardashian for a retrospective of fashion designer Terry Mugler. In recent years, the MMFA has seen attendance triple to 1.3 million, attracting visitors with everything from fashion exhibits to art therapy. If you're 20 or younger, it's free. And for the under 30 crowd, there's the avant-garde VIP pass with special events. They feel that it's their place that it's the place to be, but also that it's their place. They don't feel that it's not their place, that they're, they're, this is my grandma uh, uh, museum. No, it's their museum. From Vancouver to Toronto, events are popping up as museums look for ways to stay relevant. But it all starts with what you pay. And at this AGO lineup, the new prices are an easy sell. Did you hear that they're changing the prices, that now if you're 25 or under, you can go for free? No, I didn't. Yeah. Cool. It allows like younger youths to come at like, no price and check out art, and I think that's great. AGO's experiment begins later this month. Eli Glasper, CBC News, Toronto. Next, our moment, a historic day for Taiwan and the LGBTQ community around the world. I'm privileged to be in Canada uh, and very fortunate to be here and I think being able to express myself fr so freely here and now my friends in Taiwan can do it too. First though a preview of the Sunday interview with Valerie Jarrett, former senior White House advisor, longtime friend of the Obamas. She told Rosie about the first time she met Michelle back when Michelle was just 26 and looking for a job. And I offered a job on the spot. A couple days later I said well and she said, with bad news, my fiancé doesn't think it's such a good idea. And I'm like, who's your fiancé? And why do we care what he thinks? <laughs> and she said, his name is Barack Obama. He started his career as a community organizer. Would you have dinner with us to talk about it? Am I glad I said yes. <laughs> and that was in 1991. When you had that dinner, did you guys click immediately? We did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. And Barack Obama said, you know, where are you from? I said, Chicago. Where'd you grow up? Chicago. Were you born here? Well, no, I was born in Iran, and he's like, well, that's interesting. I lived in Indonesia for a while, and so we talked about what we had yeah. learned from having lived outside of the United States and our ability to walk in a room and connect with people of all walks of life, and also that the United States is a great country. It's not the only country. Today in Taiwan, even the pouring rain couldn't stop the celebration as thousands of people gathered outside Parliament to hear what they'd been waiting to hear for so long. Same-sex marriage is officially legalized. Taiwan is the first place in Asia to do so. Its celebration, that's our moment. I think I meant everything I can marry in both countries now, which is pretty amazing. Being able to really just be free, to be open, to be who I am, it just means a lot. It was rainy, unfortunately, but just everybody was out on the streets and they're just kind of waving their flags around and being happy. I actually was asleep when most of this happened. Because <laughs> as you know, it's 12 hours apart. My mom texted me at 4 in the morning and I saw her text. I was like, oh my God. I kind of wish I was there to be a part of the parades and the parties, but just seeing 
everybody posts about it or through Facebook and social media, I felt really included, like, wow, this is my, my culture, my country making progress. I'm privileged to be in Canada uh, and I'm very fortunate to be here. And I think being able to express myself fr so freely here and now my friends in Taiwan can do that too. So it's a huge day for them. Interestingly, the next country to keep an eye on for this is Costa Rica, which uh, is expected uh, to legalize same-sex marriage by February of 2020, but it doesn't always work that way. In February of 2018, Bermuda retracted, uh, repealed its same-sex marriage legislation. That is how it goes. That is a national for May 17th. Good night.